Well, welcome tonight. We're going to be talking about confirmation and hopefully get to the Eucharist. I've already spoken to, uh, spent two nights on the Mass, so some of that, I, I won't go into all the depth of that. But I want to begin in prayer and then a, a scripture reading. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving Father, I ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us tonight and upon me that I might teach and we might all receive question and answer, that it might be a time of encountering you and, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit might work among us and with us. And so grace us tonight with this holy fire. And I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, like I said, I want to talk, uh, begin with confirmation. And I, uh, important scripture for, for me is the, uh, well, for I think, I hope for the whole church uh, in this regards, is Isaiah 11, 1 to 6. And I want to talk about this in sort of the, uh, the big picture. So this is, uh, you'll, you will um, recognize this. You, you, you'll place this probably in terms of the, uh, the Christmas season, but it's talking about Emmanuel and the rule of Emmanuel and what this kingship would look like. And so Isaiah prophesizes, a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and, a, and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and a fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Not by appearance shall he judge, nor by hearsay, sh hearsay shall he decide, but he shall judge the poor with justice and decide a right for the land afflicted. He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Justice shall be the band around his waist, and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. Then the wolf shall be a guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. And think of this in just in terms of, uh, there you have a scriptural reference to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord shall be upon him. But it's in terms of this ideal perfect king and the establishment of the perfect kingdom. So the, is this, you know, this, uh, um, you know the uh, eschatological, to use a huge word, just sort of like end time vision of what this world will be like, the, you know, the, the lamb and the lion and these sorts of things, and, and this, this is what it looks like. This is when we talk about eventually the fruits of the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we were talking about these foretastes and vision of the kingdom. And so when we talk about confirmation, we have to understand this, this is sort of the, the, the picture, how the Holy Spirit is supposed to work in us. And so I want to talk today, uh, uh, the, the first part of this class, and who knows how long that first part's going to be. With me, it could go the whole time, but maybe not. Um, I'll lay out just sort of some of the basics about the sacrament, what it looks like, but then I'm going to talk about the effects and, and, and what it's supposed to do and how it works. And I, the first thing I would just say is, in, it, it really is supposed to be kind of like our own personal Pentecost. Remember the, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, you have the account of the, those up in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit comes, it's a driving wind, the thing's so shaking, and it looks like tongues of fire or something, and these, suddenly these, these apostles are, are speaking in tongues they don't know, and, in, and with the courage they never had displayed before, and with an effectiveness and fruitfulness that's not their own. And so that idea of, well, the Holy Spirit should be part of our lives too. And so we should experience Pentecost as disciples of Christ. There should be that um, potential of the Holy Spirit to work within us. So that is sort of the context of the sacrament of, of confirmation. Now, what it actually looks like, because remember I talked about sacraments in terms of form, matter, minister, and intention. Uh, those are the sort of the building blocks of these seven uh, encounters with Christ. So again, remember, the whole purpose of these sacraments is to get us in touch with and to join with the life of God himself. So somehow grace is given to us, or at least offered to us, whether we accept that or not, and to what extent we are moved by God's grace, that's subjective within ourselves, how, how we prepare, how we receive. But there are these objective offerings and guaranteed offerings of grace to us. And in order that we could grow in this life of the kingdom that, we just, that Isaiah was prophesizing about there. 
There's this potential, and in, in this, this kingdom begins in this world, in this time, and now. I think it's always important to remember that, that it's not always, well, we're preparing for something here that's going to, there's these, this, this deep separation between um, heaven and earth, or heaven and hell and earth, these sort of things. No, it's, these, these existences, uh, they start now. They'll be confirmed uh, after death. So the, what does the liturgy look like here? What's the, what does the, the liturgy of uh, confirmation look like? First of all, the, the minister, who, who, can, who can perform the sacrament? It's the ordinary minister in the Western rite, the Western church, is the bishop. But priests can also do this. Deacons cannot, lay people cannot. The, 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 or, the ordinary minister for the Roman Catholic Church would be the, the bishop, but priests can be delegated to do that. For instance, for the RCIA, um, on Easter uh, the Vigil, if you're going to be confirmed, I will be doing that. Archbishop Sarton cannot be in all these parishes on Easter Vigil. And so he delegates that power to me to do on that night. There are sometimes I can confirm, but I can't just confirm uh, whenever I want to. I'm not the ordinary minister as the archbishop or the, or the bishop of the place. And that, that, comes, that brings into uh, uh, the point of when should we receive the sacrament? It's a one-time thing. It's one of those seals of the sacrament. So for those of you here the last few times, there are three sacraments that, that carry what the theologians call a seal. And remember the seal? The seal is something that's stamped in. It's like a, a wax, the hot wax and then the, the ring that's, that God says, I, I seal your soul with my very name. I change you. And it's a set shape and it sets and it's hardened and you can't. Once you're sealed, you're sealed. And who can tell me the three seals, the sa three sacraments that, that uh, involve a seal? Baptism. Baptism confirmation and and holy orders. So confirmation with baptism, there's this idea, they're part of the sacraments of initiation. That's why uh, the uh, RCIA, you know, if you will receive, if you're a brand new Christian, you've never been baptized before, you'll be baptized and confirmed in the same liturgy. But when, when should this happen? If it's part of the confirmation, if part of the sacraments of initiation, there's a difference between how different Christian churches do this. For instance, um, well, actually, the, the Eastern Church will, will take the original structure. The original structure was you'd be baptized, confirmed, and receive First Eucharist all at once. Uh, and, and you would, if, if you go into the Easter Vigil as a non-Christian, on that night, you will receive baptism, confirmation, and First Communion. But if you, in, in the, the early church, this was possible because the bishop would do this for everybody. Because there weren't that many. They would all gather in one place. And on the vigil, they, the bishop would always, when he baptized someone, he'd also confirm them. And if you were an adult, you received communion like normal. Or if you were a little baby, you would still, and they still in the Eastern Rite Catholic and, East, and Eastern Orthodox, at your baptism, you're also confirmed and you're given the first communion. A little spoon is taken, put down your throat with a little piece of the host and a little bit of the precious blood. A little spoon. Right down there, like a bird, you know, looking for a worm. Um, so you're done. Those are sacraments of initiation. And originally, again, it was always the bishop. Now, as the church grew and it became much more difficult, you, the bishop couldn't do it. You couldn't get around to all the, all the to baptize everybody. And so the decision was made, though, so do we, there was something very valuable about the fact that the, the bishop, the successor of the apostle, the source of unity within the diocese, would baptize everybody. You're all in communion with this, this church who's led by this shepherd. But when that's no longer possible, do you, what, which value do you take? Do you keep the, the sacraments of initiation in the, rop, the proper order, right, all together, or do you maintain that sign of the bishop being involved in your initiation? So for the Eastern Church, they said, you know what, I guess we'll just not have the bishop do it. We'll, we'll delegate this to the priest so that we can have this original order of the sacraments. In the Western Church, it developed over the centuries that, no, we want the bishop to be involved in every person's initiation. And so we can't, we can't do that for baptism, but he'll go around and confirm people as he has a chance. 
And so in the early church, it might, you know, he might not, it might be a big diocese, he might not get around to your village for years. And so you'd receive first Eucharist, I mean, first baptism, and maybe for first communion, and then sometime a bishop would come, and anybody who's not confirmed come out and be, get confirmed. And so that's still the, the, the norm in the Western church is the bishop will come around and, and confirm somebody. And when that would be, there's a debate about that. Some of the local churches now are starting to go back to before First Communion. In Spokane, the diocese, for instance, just across the mountains, you're baptized as an infant, you're confirmed in second grade before you receive First Communion, maintaining that same, same order. Um, here, we, you're confirmed at you know, high school, and everybody's already received First Eucharist, almost, more or less. And so there's a big debate about that, and I'm not going to get into it. But all I'm saying is that there's, don't be surprised that there's different uh, practices uh, around the, the Western church about this. The actual, what it looks like is that the person to be confirmed, let's, let's say the bishop will be doing this, because that's um, often the case with uh, cradle Catholics at least, that you, the, the, you know, it's in the midst of a mass usually, and I'm not going to go into the liturgy of the Eucharist, but you, the, the, the bishop would lay hands and then a prayer, again, this would be the form, it's a long prayer, it's not just like, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a, there's a chunk, you know. So the bishop or the priest will, will pray the prayer, the form of the sacrament, and then taking chrism will anoint your head, with, you know, probably with a cross, but sometimes it's a big sloppy cross and sometimes it's a delicate little... Um, tweaky little cross, but everybody does it differently. But you, you'll be anointed on your forehead with chrism, and uh, with the words, you know, John, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so it's this sealing idea of the Holy Spirit, and chrism is this olive oil that's filled with perfumes, and it's used in baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. Um, so in baptism, even if in the West, when you're not being confirmed at the time of your baptism, your little baby, will, there will be chrism smeared on his or her head. The idea of, remember like yesterday, or not yesterday, last week, we talked about priest, prophet, and king. Being baptized into Christ as priest, prophet, and king. You're anointed as the king of Israel. Remember when the prophets, you know, Samuel or somebody, would, would choose Saul or David, he, he would pour the oil, this, this chrism, on this man to anoint him, he's the Lord's anointed at that point. He is the king of Israel. And so that's still part of this idea of this kingly reality. If you are going to Europe and, and you go to a coronation of one of the European kings, they will be anointed with chrism. You know, someday Charles III will be crowned king of Britain, you know. And in that ceremony, chrism will become, and they'll pour chrism all, chrism all over his head. Because it's a kingly idea. And so, and so if a bishop or in a priestly ordination, the chrism, this olive oil filled with a certain formula of perfume, is anoint, anoints your hands. So again, your hands are anointed for the Lord's work. And as a bishop, it's not your hands that are anointed, they've already been anointed because you're already a priest. But the bishop, the oil of the chrism will be poured over his head. And it's just glop, glop, glop. You know, it's, it's just like, ugh. Um, and so, you know, they just got this oily head for days uh, because you got olive oil all over your head. Um, anyway, for confirmation, that's what you're confirmed with, is this chrism, this kingly oil. And just as Jesus, you know, coming up out of the water at his baptism in the Jordan, the, he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down upon him. So you, as a baptized priest, prophet, and king, the Holy Spirit wants to anoint you uh, in, in confirmation. So that's, that's you know, what it looks like. I now want to just, and uh, who does it, but I want to talk about the effects of confirmation. And in some ways, the, I, I'm just going to briefly read them out and just make some comments about them later. But, but um, this, is what the, this is what the catechism says. You know, what, are, what's the, what are the effects of confirmation? Uh, first off, you're marked, marked with a character or seal forever which roots us more deeply in our status as adopted sons and daughters of God. So this idea that we're, we're more deeply rooted in this status, more deeply, unites us more firmly to Christ, increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us, 
So we're not saying that there's no, there's no involvement of the Holy Spirit in baptism. And as you, you may have already recognized, the, the confirmation is some way an intensifier. It's this idea of, and I, the, the, what I always use is the idea of salt. Intensifies flavor, at least I think it does. This idea that you, you salt food to, in, in to bring out the flavor that may already be there, but you want to intensify it. And so that's what this confirmation is. It roots us more deeply in our status as adopted sons and daughters of God. We're already a son and daughter of God at baptism. And now we're just going to add salt to the, to the dish. Unites us more firmly to Christ. Increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. Renders our bond with the church more perfect. Gives us a special strength of the Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word, action, as true witnesses of Christ. To confess the, the, the name of Christ more boldly and never be ashamed of the cross. And so I'm going to talk about these um, in, in just a minute, but in terms of the, the, gifts, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I just want to, sometimes people say, well, so is my baptism imperfect? No, your baptism is imperfect. It's not, you know, because I need confirmation, does that mean the baptism was somehow missing something? No, it's everything the baptism is supposed to be. But again, Christ established this sacrament as well, the, the baptism and the anointing of the Spirit. These are both part of the whole initiation. If you want, you want to be fully initiated in the body of Christ, this is what it is. There's an intensifier of this that, that goes along with this uh, new life. Now, so it's mission and witness of the confirmed. What are these seven gifts? I'm going to talk about them just briefly. It's wisdom. Um, the idea that there's an intensification of wisdom in us. This enables us to see the world from God's viewpoint, which helps us grasp God's purpose and plan. You know, that's what wisdom, I think, a holy wisdom is. I see as God sees. I have glimpses into his plan that the worldly view doesn't understand. It takes a long-range view of history and long-range view of life and say, I'm going to look at this life of mine and the decisions I make from the views of eternity. Because I want to look from God's viewpoint, which saves us from the illusion of living in the spirit of the age. I mean, it, how many of us are caught up in the spirit of the age? That I, I, I'm going to live as the world tells me to live, because if I don't, then I'm out of touch. I'm out of time. I'm behind the times. Have you ever been told you're behind the times? Um, do your, does your children ever tell you, get with it? You guys are way behind. Um, pick up the pace, mom or dad, because you're out of it. Um, in fact, you can't even see it anymore. You're so far behind, it's, it's, you don't even see the dust cloud. Um, and the church would say, hmm, who, what are you talking about here? I, I remember there was a, uh, I, I think there's a Pierce Morgan. Does he have a talk show? Is there a Pierce Morgan? Yeah. Um, and and they, they had, uh, it wasn't Rick Warren is the Protestant minister of Saddleback Church. And he had this interview with, with, uh, with Pierce Morgan. Morgan was, was just talking to him, basically trying to get him to admit he was wrong about his notion in, in, in the teaching on, on homosexual marriage and things like this. And, and there might have been a few other the hot button issues that Rick Warren was, just wasn't on the same page as Piers Morgan. I mean, they, and he said, you know, you not only are offending and, and you know, isolating yourself from me, but from millions of Americans. Doesn't that ever bother you? And, and, you know, again, they went around in circles. And eventually Rick Warren said, well, ultimately, I, you know, aren't you, Piers would say, aren't you afraid that you're going to be, you, the trajectory of history is leaving you behind. You're on the wrong side of the trajectory of history. Uh, doesn't that, you know, aren't you afraid that that's what's happening here? And he says, well, ultimately, I, you know, what I'm afraid of is offending God, not you, Pierce. Um, and he said, you know, it's ultimately not about um, the, t the spirit of the times. A true wisdom looks from God's perspective. How do I understand that? Or knowledge, another gift. And this, the church usually teaches us, is, is directed towards contemplation, reflection, and meditation. How do I really get to know something? Well, I meditate upon it. I, I contemplate it. I, I embrace it. I take, it takes time. Um, and it takes a certain, imagine, to gaze, to reflect. That is a true form of knowledge. Um, and it's a deep knowledge. Um, so this, the, the very idea that the Holy Spirit is going to help me know you or know, know something or know 
you know, an experience if I can learn to meditate, contemplate, and reflect upon it, which is again fairly countercultural. Understanding. It stimulates us to work on knowing ourselves so we can know God. This is the, how the, the, whole, the catechism describes it. There's an understanding. That it, it, I didn't put these in the right order, obviously. At least not the order the catechism was putting them in. But this idea of know thyself, that was even from the pagan philosophers. Socrates always said that. You know, that if you really want wisdom, if you really want to understand yourself, you have to know who you are. If, just... Just get to know who you are, which is as a adopted child and son of God, fallen yet noble, made in the image and likeness of God. But understand who you are. Fortitude is simply trust that we are prepared to stand up for Christ in the gospel when challenged, and to be able to endure suffering patiently. Uh, sometimes that we are required to do that. In life, there's no getting around a situation that we find ourselves in. Um, fear dominates our lives. And so this very gift of fortitude allows us to, the, the, the ability to stand up and to accept what you know, is happening to us and, and needs to. And to say, you know, I can't dodge this. I, I am, and not only can I not dodge it, I don't want to. I, I'm willing to stand up for what I believe in and what, what, who Christ is. I, I tell the story of the, uh, an RCIA type. Uh, I, don't know, I don't remember if she was a catechumen or a candidate. This is back in Port Angeles. And, you know, oftentimes it's the converts who are the strongest. You know, because they are, the, they're, the Holy Spirit's working with them just very strongly. And so there was this new convert. And so she had just been received in the church. And she, you know, she wanted to sort of defend the faith and just say, kind of declare, raise the flag and declare, this is who I am. So she nailed this crucifix to her front door. So there's this crucifix, you know, it, you know, I don't remember how big it was. It wasn't like life-size. That would really be kind of strange. But, but it was a regular Catholic crucifix, and it was the outside of her front door. So if any missionaries from some other little group or something was coming up, they say, you know, you knock at your, you know, beware of Catholic, um, because um, it's not a dog that's going to get you. I'm going to come out and, you know, I'm going to tell you what I believe. And so I always thought that was kind of an interesting, um, I, didn't, I didn't think that she lacked fortitude in terms of, she was perfectly willing to engage. Okay. In fact, I'm going to tell you who I am even before you knock. Counsel. The sense, the quiet teaching the Holy Spirit gives us about our moral lives and training of our conscience. This idea of counsel, the Holy Spirit is also the paraclete. It's not simply this fire, but also it's the advisor. You know, imagine the smartest, most expensive attorney you can find. You know, the, the best, you know, the, the one who can always tell you, not now, hold your, hold your thought, stand up, now speak, oh, don't say this, say that. Um, the, the, don't, you, don't you love it when you, don't you have any friends, I hope, that are good counselors for you? Someone you can depend on and say, Okay, I'm calling you up. Talk me out of this. Talk me off the ledge, because right now I think I'm going crazy. And you, you count on them to give you good counsel. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit is the best counselor. That's one of the reasons we go into prayer, is so that we can take advantage of, and we're open to the Holy Spirit's counsel. The Holy Spirit's the paraclete, which is, again, just a, a, this idea of a, of a lawyer of a, in the Roman times. Piety, which is a word that we don't really like much anymore. To call somebody pious usually isn't, a, certainly in the world to call somebody pious is, an, is sort of a, it's kind of a priggish little, uh, smuggish little, you know, person. You don't want to be pious. Uh, usually it's ad overly pious. I mean, it's a little phrase you just sort of tag on to somebody if you want to sort of stick a little knife into them. Oh, she's nice, but she maybe may a little pious. Um, it's kind of an old lady word. Um, now, that's not a slam against old ladies. That, that is, and none of you are. Um, nobody here applies that, that applies to, but, but it's used in a pejorative way to try to say you're acting like a little old lady, a church lady, right? In reality, what this is is simply a respect for the Father who creates us, a reverence 
for those who have reverence due. And so, it's, it, again, it's, a, it's, it's very important that we have this quality if we're really going to be uh, sons and daughters of God. That I, the whole idea of God is God and I'm not, and I treat God like God. Um, it doesn't mean that he's fearsome and is, you know, distant in the sense that I can never have any contact with him, but it always remembers that God is God. Uh, it's a, it's a, a great gift to be able to do that. And then the fear of the Lord seems very strange because we don't like to be afraid because it isn't fortitude against the fear of the Lord. Well, this is kind of going back to, it unites with piety in some ways, and infuse honesty into our relationship with God. When I'm saying God is God and we're not, I guess that I really meant that to be the fear of the Lord. Because I, I, I sometimes, most of you have raised children, I suspect, and there's sometimes when you say, you know what, um, there's a role here. Um, you're the kid and I'm the parent. That doesn't mean that you don't have your own dignity and your own respect, and that I do too. But, but, um, you're you, I'm me, we have these roles, and they're not going to be confused right now. Now, in human terms, you grow up, so eventually your child, you hope, becomes your, this, this fellow adult where you still have a respectful relationship because you're the parent, but you are in some sense peers. You, you, you grow up, you're adults, and you can talk as an adult. And you can't boss your kids around as much as you try anymore because your relationship's changed. But in God's terms, we never grow up to the point where we can sort of boss around God, or we can say, God, you know, we're just like this because you and me. Um, that's not the way it is. Uh, the fear of the Lord is always to remember that God is God. Now, so those are, um, those are the things we hope are intensifying with this, the, the grace of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we earn. It is something we can open ourselves to, but it's not something we produce. It's something the Holy Spirit gives us as gift. And that's part of what this sacrament's about. And from this, we, if you, if you uh, Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruits of the Spirit. So from this life of the Holy Spirit coming into me more fully, the fruits of the Holy Spirit from Galatians 5.22 are this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, uh, self-control, chastity. I mean, that is, is a pretty good description of a saintly person. Now again, saintly is kind of like pious, and sometimes we have these pushback on that word. But what, it's really an incredibly attractive possibility if I could really be someone who is filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity. I mean, just those first seven Wow. I mean, if I could just be sort of all those. But then, there's more. It's like one of those, uh, those advertisements of the Ginsu Nais or something. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, chastity. Just think, the Holy Spirit is filling me, again, with God's life so that this grace shines through in these ways. These are the fruits of these things. When I open myself to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I become this person. God shining forth in such a way that I'm filled with love and joy and peace, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, goodness. Um, and these aren't bad things. They're not weak things at all. Um, you could have a king that was like this, a saintly king. You could have the greatest war. You could have, but they would have these, the fruit from their life. And so what a beautiful thing uh, the Holy Spirit offers us uh, in this whole idea of the courage to speak out, the, the piety to know who God is, the understanding to be able to sense God. You know, sometimes one of the, tr the troubles is in discerning. How can I listen to the counsel of the Holy Spirit? Some of us are better at listening to God than others. Do you know that? I hope you realize that. Some, some people will always tell you, you know, I, and, you, and you believe them, say, you know, I can just, God doesn't want me to do that. And uh, sometimes you know, I don't get anything. I mean, I'm, um, I'm, not listen, I, I mean, I'm not hearing it's a beautiful gift to, have, to develop this uh, openness to the, the counsel of the Holy Spirit. So, questions on confirmation. Any questions on that part of the, the talk? That's my little confirmation uh, bit. How does the Catholic Church view its ascetic confirmed in another Christian? Okay, the Catholic Church would, wouldn't... Ex remember, remember. The short answer is, 
The Catholic Church accepts as valid the confirmations of the Eastern Orthodox churches and also what we call the uh, churches of the East. And these are small churches like the Assyrian Church of Iraq, um, the Coptic Church of, uh, of Egypt, but they would not accept the Episcopal um, or the, the Lutheran uh, or some of the other, they would not accept Protestant uh, confirmation. The reason being that those churches do not have valid holy orders. So remember, the necessary minister is a validly ordained priest or bishop. And so the Protestant churches, other than the Anglican Episcopal, the Protestant churches don't even claim to have the sacrament of holy orders. They, they don't believe in it. They have pastors, but they just say they're not priests and they're not, they're not ordained to a separate priesthood. And so since you don't, they do not have holy orders, you say, you know, the, uh, if you're a Protestant, you would be confirmed at the Easter Vigil. If you're Eastern Orthodox coming into the church, and it's happened before, I've had, they don't confirm or anything. They just make a profession of faith, and that's it for them. Everybody else gets to go in the water, everybody else gets to have a little chrism and stuff. They, they just kind of, you know, I declare I believe what the Catholic Church teaches, and I want to be a Catholic. I say, okay, that's good enough. Um, you're a Catholic. Because they're, so they're close. They're very close theologically. Good question. Anybody else? One more time. In fact, I'm going to read it to you from the Bible just to make sure you believe that I really actually, what I'm saying is true. It's Galatians 5.22. At least I think it is. I hope I got that right. Yes. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit, I hope these guys are doing the same words that I have. Anyway, this, this, this version. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So they put chastity and self-control in the same one. But it, that's, that's where it's from. It's Galatians 5.22. So where in Isaiah 11, uh, 1 through 6, does it talk about piety? Well, there's two different words here. The, the old Bible is, is, you have fear of the Lord twice there. And so, if you look at the translation, in the old translation, there is, is two separate things. In the new translation, they said, you know, it's both, we're going to translate it twice, the same thing. But these are, that's where that came from. It's a different translation. Okay. So, so I'm going to go forward, because I ran out of time last time, and I want to go forward a little bit and just talk a little bit about the Eucharist. Um, so I just get back on track. Remember, I talked to, about the Mass twice already, so I, I already talked about the Eucharist somewhat. But I do just want to talk a little bit about um, some of the little theological and, 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 um, and also devotional points outside of the Mass where the Eucharist is involved. And what I really want to stress is um, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and that this, the, the Eucharist is the source and summit of the whole Christian life. Um, this is what all the other sacraments are, are, are aimed at is this communion with God the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, in the Eucharist. And for us, the a Catholic thing you have to get is that we believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That this really is the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus under the appearance of bread and wine. And I want to take a little trip through history just to kind of draw that out. It'll be brief, but um, I, want to, I want you to just to try to understand that from the very beginning, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 11. And what I want to talk about here is, is the way Paul looks at um, the tradition of the Eucharist. So I'm going to read here uh, uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through probably eh, maybe 30. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, so the Last Supper, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread of or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
And this idea of there, you have to be able to, to receive communion, you have to believe that that really is my body and blood. Now, they, in the first century, would not talk about transubstantiation, all these theological concepts. They, they didn't try to theologize about it. They just knew that this, Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood. And I want to talk to you in terms of, 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 there was never a time until the 11th century that any Christian within the, the, the major church ever denied or, or argued against this. For instance, I want to talk to you about uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who wrote around 100 to 110 AD, so a few years after John died. So you have you know, Paul writing in the 50s AD, what we just heard, and then we have John writing John 6, the great bread of life discourse, probably in the 90s. I'm not going to read that whole chapter, but I recommend it for you. This idea, he, he just stressed that this is, you know, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you'll have no life within you. And people re rejected this idea, this is cannibalism, this is ridiculous, this is absurd. And he just let him go. He says, you know, this is what it is. You need my body and blood. You need to eat and drink. I'm, I'm going to be your food. So that's in the 90s when he wrote that down. That was, doesn't mean that Jesus said in the 90s, but it, it, it was part of the Christian experience then. And this is Antioch, uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, writing his letter to the Romans. I have no taste for corruptible food, nor for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love uncorruptible. And then a little bit later on, he's, um, to, to, oh, actually, a different letter, he says this, St. Ignatius again, who was a direct disciple of John the, the Apostle. Um, he's talking about these, uh, the Docetists, this heretical movement. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. So just as sort of a throwaway line, he's saying one of their problems is they don't believe that this Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in 150 A.D., so this is about 40 years after uh, St. Ignatius. Justin Martyr, who is the first, one who is first described the Mass in any sort of detail at all. And he said, we call, so he's, trying to, he's writing to the emperor, trying to describe why they shouldn't be killed anymore. That we're, not, we're not doing anything crazy, we're not doing anything bad. He says, we call this food Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true, and who has been washed in the washing which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration, and is thereby living as Christ has enjoined. So that's baptism. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but since Jesus our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer, set down by him, and by the change which, and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nourished, is both the flesh and blood of the incarnate Jesus. And then, 40 years later, St. Irenaeus of Leon, in his work against the heresies, he wrote, that Christ has declared the cup, a part of, so the cup, the wine, which is part of creation, to be his own blood, from which he causes our blood to flow, and the bread, a part of creation, he has established as his own body, from which he gives increase to our bodies. If the Lord were from other than the Father, how could he rightly take bread, which is of the same creation as our own, and confess it to be his body and affirm that the mixture in the cup is his blood? So again, there's just this assumption that this is what they believe. Now, in 244, this is the last one, and I'll, and I'll stop. Um, I think this is the one from Origen. I wish to admonish you with examples from your religion. You are accustomed to take part in the divine mysteries. So he's talking about other good Catholics. He's saying, you're, 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 you're accustomed to take part in the divine mysteries, which is the Eucharist. So you know how, when you have received the body of the Lord, you reverently exercise every care, lest a particle of it fall, and lest anything of the consecrated gift perish. You account yourselves guilty, and rightly do you so believe, if any of it is lost through negligence. Now that, this, this the whole idea, of you've received the body of the Lord. And so there's, you have to be really careful of this stuff. Don't let any particle of it drop because it's the body of the Lord. 
you notice that's the, still the way we, we act in the Mass. Since, you know, that's 244 AD, but it's still in 2014, we put a corporal down on the, on the altar to make sure that no crumb is, is lost of this, what looks like bread. And sometimes when you, when you break the bread, the host actually, not the bread anymore, a little particle flies out just because it snaps, you know? Um, and so we put a corporal down so no crumb is lost. And you notice that the priest will go back there to the cups and we take all the, the vessels, we put water in them, we make sure there's no particle left, we put them from vessel to vessel, we wipe them with these uh, cloths called purificators, and we take all the water through all the cups to make sure there's no drop of the precious blood that, is, that isn't uh, wiped away, and then we drink the whole thing. And we wipe down these vessels with these purificators, which are treated specially, that we collect these purificators after they've been used, we soak them to get any particle that might somehow be there, and we, we never pour those down the drain into the sewer, we pour them onto living plants. If, just in case there's anything left there, we, we put them into the ground rather than into the sewer. Now you might think that's a wholly elaborate thing, but it's really just going back to what Origen was saying in 244. That's what they did back then. They said, you be very careful, nothing's lost. It just underlines the fact that, again, until the 11th century, this was never about debated. And even then it was just brief. It wasn't until the Protestant Reformation that this whole question became a live question that this was not the body and blood of Christ. And when we talk about transubstantiation, how many of you have, have were heard the word transubstantiation? I mean, how would you like to spell that? Um, yeah, this is a, the, a theological teaching of how, what this change is. At the Eucharist, the priest or bishop says the words of institution, the words Christ said at the Last Supper, and this Eucharistic prayer, again, as I think it was St. Ignatius said, this Eucharistic prayer changes, Jesus uses the priest, he acts in the person of Christ, it changes into the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Now, when we talk about transubstantiation, it's just a, it's just a, a way to try to explain in, in, in concepts that we can grasp what happens here and why, what the weird thing is. Because it still looks, tastes like bread and wine. And if you were to be so sacrilegious as to do a, an experiment upon a host, the chemistry would not change at all. It's not like you're going to suddenly see this host, you know, this little piece of the host, and it's going to be registering as flesh, human flesh somehow. It's, it, the, the chemistry is still going to say the, out, the outer looks like bread. It has the same chemical makeup, it has the same whatever, weight, whatever. Thomas Aquinas and some others, I'm simplifying, but, but the medieval theologians, using the languages in the categories of Aristotle from the Greek times, talked about subject, um, substances and accidents. And everything has, it has a substance. I mean, my substance is that of a human being. That's what I am as a human being. The accidents are the stuff that the senses can register. Like if you were looking at me, you would say, this is a guy, the substance is a human being, the accidents are about 6'4", 190 on a good day, pounds, um, two hands, um, two eyes, kind of brownish, going gray hair. You know, those are the accidents. Nose this long, ears, you know, and you all have your accidents. You know, you have your own, you know, my, my senses register you with your own particularities. And the, the whole point of this transubstantiation thing is, is the, it's very, oftentimes, substances change and accidents change. I'm, I am a human being now. If you were to shoot me, I would no longer be a human being, I'd be a body. Um, um, but I would not be a living human being, I would be a corpse. And then you could burn me or something and I'd be ashes or whatever. I would change substance. Or you could take this, this podium right here. Right now it's a podium, right? It's a wooden podium. I could burn that and it would no longer be a podium. Or I could carve it up into chess pieces and make a lot of little pawns, kings, and knights and stuff. And suddenly it would no longer be a podium, it would be four chess sets. Its substance would change. Its accidents would also change. Because once you start to burn it, it becomes gray, brown, and, and nasty. 
And if you carve it, it the accidents, it looks smaller. It's not, you know, my, my senses register something differently. But you could have the same substance here. This is a podium, and it's kind of natural covered, colored wood, and I could paint it red. And suddenly the accents change. It's red. It's a red podium. But the substance is still the same. Substance doesn't change at all. But the accidents do. And, and think about yourself. Your accidents change over time. I used to be that big. Now I'm this big. I used to be 100 pounds. Now I'm 190. Um, you know, I can do all these sort of things, but I'm still me. I could lose an arm in an accident. Now I only have one hand, but it's still me. The substance hasn't changed. The accidents have. The, the, outer, the outer registering things. So the strange thing about transubstantiation of the Eucharist is that the accidents stay the same, but the substance changes. And that's really weird. That there's nothing else that, that you know, what the church says is the accidents of taste, smell, uh, molecular makeup of this stuff, the accidents don't change at all. But the substance of what it is, the isness, it changes. So it's transubstance. The substance changes, transubstantiation. And the, and the accidents don't change at all. Now, there are times, there's a few, and I've seen them, one, of, one or two of them, where, whether you believe this or not is, is a matter of faith and, and et cetera, but there's these Eucharistic miracles. Lanciano is one of them. Have you been to Lanciano? And it's a little town in Italy where this host from the Middle Ages became flesh. Now, this was a trans, everything. I mean, this, is, this was the accidents changed, everything changed. Um, this, is, this would be a miraculous event because they said, oh, believe it or not, they said, I, I don't know if this, this priest suddenly had this piece of flesh in his hand, this round piece of flesh. And the scientists actually, they did, they cut it up and they, they did an examination of it in its heart muscle of a human being. It's, it's flesh, it's coming from a heart. Weird. And so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, okay, now you have to believe in that. Um, what I'm saying is, that would be a situation, not a transubstantiation, because the accidents have changed as well as the substance. That's just a weird, miraculous, or it's either a hoax or a weird miracle. But it's not transubstantiation. The thing about transubstantiation, sometimes people think, every Mass is a miracle. I say, no, it's not. Um, because a miracle has to be outwardly demonstrated through scientific, et cetera, and you, a miracle you know, somebody who's not a believer could, could say, yeah, once she used to be like that, but now she's cured, she no, has long, no longer has any cancer, and my instruments aren't registering this at all. Whereas a scientist is going to look at a, a, the, a consecrated host and say, this is the same as it was before. There's no proof scientifically there's anything changed in her at all. Um, and so in that sense, it's not a miracle. It is, in the sen it is a, a marvel, but only faith can see it. But a miracle is testable. Um, anyway, that's a, a digression. We as, hum as Catholics, we reverence this real presence of the Eucharist in the sense of we have these tabernacles in our churches, or in some of them, they're in chapels. We kneel before them. We think, we believe. Jesus is present in a unique way. It's a unique, sacramental presence is unique. It's real. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which Jesus is present in the world. Jesus' presence in, is, is in presence in the book. There's a way in which this is the word. There's a way in which Jesus is present in the body of Christ, the people. That's true. He's present that way. Jesus is present in some ways everywhere. He's God. But there, and, he's, and he's also present in, in heaven, whatever that experience is, body and soul, with the, with the marks of the cross still on him. He's present in a unique way there. But there is a this Eucharistic sacramental present is its own animal, so to speak. There's a physicality there, there's a locality there um, that's different than these other ways of being real present. So for Catholics, that real present is very crucial for us in our devotional life and in our uh, sacramental life. In fact, we worship the host. We worship the host. In fact, we have this thing called a monstrance where we put the host in the middle of this, this starburst of gold and we put this glass container, the luna, the moon, so it's called, and you put the host in that and you put it on the altar and you meditate on that. 
I mean, talking about you know, these, these gifts of the Holy Spirit, we meditate and pray before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And that's because we take this seriously. And we really believe that that's Jesus in a way that, I mean, I'm not going to meditate in front of Kyle. Although he's a good person, he's made the image of the likeness of God, and I'm not even saying that Christ isn't present in him, because I think he might be, he is. But not in the way he's present in the host. The way in which Jesus himself said, I'm going to be with you always. And I'm going to be with you in a physical way. I am going to ascend to heaven with my human body, but I am going to be with you. I am going to let you see me, touch me, and taste me. That's the whole idea of this Eucharist. That there is, I am going to be food for you. And you're going to become me, as, and I'm going to become you. As, we, as you feed on me, I'm, you know, you're going to turn more and more into me. I'm going to fill you your life. So, there, there's so much more I can say about um, the Eucharist, but those are just some of the the little things, and, and the RCA has a chance to, to ask more questions uh, a little bit later. But any questions? I have about five minutes for questions. Any questions about the Eucharist? I know, and I know I haven't. Uh, we we had the two mass classes, but any any questions about what I brought up today? Okay, so there was a, a parish down, uh, I think it was the Holy Family White Center. And the, the, there was some talk that there was a Eucharistic Miller hole there. That I believe the, uh, the host started to change color or something, like blood or something like that. Um, I have not heard anything more about that. I, 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 would, I am not uh, suggesting that that is a valid Eucharistic miracle. Um, in fact, so I, I, I don't know, have a lot of information about it. I do know that somehow it fell into water or something. Um, there's some connection with water there. You always have to be careful. Of, maybe this is just mold. I don't know whether it is or not. But I haven't heard anything more. That was months ago. And I, don't, and I think I would have heard, I think that, I suspect that it's just proven that it wasn't. Um, that it was just, people oftentimes, you know, Lanchano is a once in a century event. Um, People oftentimes see what's not there. One of my one of the priests I used to work with thought he saw a Eucharistic miracle in the host. I mean, I didn't see it. I, I don't. I think it, maybe it's something that God was doing him privately in his personal devotion life. But I don't think it was a Eucharistic miracle. And so the church is very slow to say that this is actually something miraculous. People sometimes think that we're very credible and that we're naive and we're always these superstitious idiots who are always going after these things. But in fact. No, we, I think we actually are very, we do believe that the supernatural is, is alive and that God does do strange and miraculous things in our lives, but we also know that human nature being what it is, we're often, uh, we, we jump to conclusions oftentimes. And so the church, is, and the church is very slow, actually, to make any determination. There's this very idea that um, if, you've, if you've heard of the appearance of Mary at Medjugorje in, in uh, Serbia, or I guess it's in Bosnia, Herzegovina now, the church has been very slow to make any determination about that. It's been decades since th th this is happening. And only now is the Vatican actually making this serious uh, investigation because most of the time we just want these things to well, they'll just disappear. Um, but eventually some determination might have to be made or maybe just say, well, we'll have to wait some more. We're very sl actually very slow to make any kind of commitment to something like this. One more question. Or maybe none more. Okay, well, let's finish with prayer then. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, Father, thank you for the gift of your Son and of the Spirit. You made us to live in the Trinity. Uh, you sent the Spirit to fill us. You sent Jesus, your Son, to feed us, uh, that we might just be in communion with you in ways that we cannot yet even imagine. I ask you to deepen our faith in you and in the Son and in the Spirit. We might truly be Trinitarian people. And so bless us with your presence, bless us with your grace and power, and protect us from all evil until we meet again. And we ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.